All right, aloha guys. This is the part two video of preparing to hunt axis deer for the Lanai State uh, Archery Axis Deer Hunt. That's a lot of words in one. But anyway, hopefully I said that right. Um, but uh, part one, I kind of covered a little bit about the logistics, the kind of the things outside of the hunt, the hunt itself, the management issues that we have in Hawaii, um, a little bit about that, you know, maybe if this is a hunt that interests you, maybe you should do it as soon as possible because I personally, and I could be wrong always, but I personally personally feel that the environmental lobby or environmentalist lobby in Hawaii is gonna have some influence in getting rid of the hunt at some point. And I'm, you know, I'm actually slightly surprised that, that it exists still today. So if that interests you, definitely get on it. But uh, I hope that maybe this video part two might be more interesting for you guys because it's more about the hunting part of things. Um, and hopefully maybe I can shorten your learning curve, give you a more quality experience on the hunt if you're coming overseas and never hunted them before or even if you're a local here and have hunted them a little bit or maybe not at all um, but maybe don't have mentors or people to teach you or, or to learn from hopefully maybe I can at least be some resource here I kind of have to caveat this though um, this this is purely from my own experience there's a lot of other experience out there, right? You know, there's a lot of locals that live there that you can learn from. There are going to be better resources than, than I could ever be, probably. Um, and I would say definitely don't take my word as the gospel or anything like that. This has just been my experience on it. And this is my experience very specific to this hunt. And mind you, this is the only state public uh, hunt for Axis Deer. There might be other areas that have access there inside of it that the state does have control of, but not specifically kind of managed or specific just for access there. This is the only one. It's on the island of Lanai. I've already explained. It's a privately owned island that the state leases to hold the public hunt. So it's not particularly public land like, you know, some people like to wear as a, as a badge of honor. You know, I'm a public land hunter or whatever. It is private land, but open for, um, allowed for public hunting that, that our state of Hawaii puts on. So just making that designation clear here. And again, just my experience, don't take it as gospel, but hopefully useful for you. And um, I touched on a little bit, there's gonna be a learning curve for, for hunting these axes there. This is a public hunt, right? It's crowded sometimes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to speak from this from the point of the uh, the bow hunting or the archery side of things because I think if you've seen any of my prior, prior videos for the Axis Deer Hunt, I think that's probably the highest interest of the current audience that I have. So um, I'll kind of focus this around bow hunting. And of course this can apply to the gun season, but uh, I'll give it a quick difference, difference here um, that you can learn from. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Let's see. So the, the archery deer hunt generally doesn't have a quota on how many people can hunt it. It used to be held over one week over the years with Corona. And then now this new season where they're going to for 2024, they're going to make it like four weeks and you draw a week or something like that. But there's not a, a bow hunter quota, not like the, uh, the gun seasons where there's a certain limit of how many people can go each weekend. And it's held used to be like nine weekends of gun when I was a kid. Now it's expanded, you know, muzzleloader youth and maybe even more gun seasons now. So, um, in the recent past you know kind of because of corona and there wasn't as much hunting populations had exploded for a small period of time there um, they made more hunting which cut the population down quite seriously uh from the gun seasons and even the maybe the archery seasons too um, but anyway the population has been cut down a bit because of those extended seasons and again mind you there's a lot of environmentalists in hawaii that say public hunting can't manage the numbers that's total BS because the data would suggest from this hunt that public hunting can manage the numbers. In fact, can really significantly reduce them down. Just that, you know, strangely, the scientists out there don't want to follow the real science. They would rather follow the science that is convenient to them instead and push the environmentalist agenda versus just look at the numbers. And the, I would submit to them the Lanai, the public Lanai state hunt is, is the data that shows that hunters can manage these numbers. 
They can take them down, they can let them go up. Hunting can manage it if it's done right. The rest of the state of Hawaii doesn't do it right, really, in my opinion, for the most part. But Lanai is one of those examples where uh, it does say it does have data to show otherwise. But anyway, yeah, learning curve. So definitely find a mentor, find somebody who's experienced hunting access there. Obviously, that's going to be the first place to go. If you've seen my videos, um, I'll just let that experience speak for itself. You know, I'm not gonna ego brag about what I do and all these other things. You guys can just go see the videos and take a look at that and you know on the merits of my videos and my content you be the judge right but uh yeah i was fortunate you know i gotta go a little bit of backstory i was very fortunate to learn from some pretty proficient uh, access deep bow hunters and um i picked up a lot of things from there so i do have to give credit where it's due there and then some things i've you know i've hunted the night since i was like 12 years old maybe when i got a hunting license maybe 11 and um picked up a lot of things along the way anyway a little bit so um, let me get a little bit into the life like the general life of the axis there so when you're on the oh i said i'd make the difference so the bow season can be crowded we're talking like you know it used to be up to like 600 people 600 bow hunters for like a eight week bow season over the area is roughly 30,000 acres so do the math there and you're going to figure out if you equally distribute everyone that's not a whole lot of acreage for everyone at one time so it could get pretty hectic at first now they split up the seasons right 2024 is going to be this multiple week thing that you got to draw or whatever and um, hopefully it's less dense but still say it's 100 or 200 people in 30,000 acres um, for bow hunting you know you can get the idea of what kind of hunter density and and crowding you're looking at you can get some pretty spooked animals and then uh Gun season is usually limited somewhere between 150 to 200. I've seen 200, maybe a little over that, and 150 maybe on the low end or something. Um, and it's guns, so you know. Just my general sense is, I have I've only hunted one gun season ever deer season when I was a kid. I didn't see a single deer. I think I saw maybe one doe. Saw a ton of sheep, and uh, we never went back because I heard so many bullets um, whizzing through the air back then. And this was, you know, 20 plus maybe almost 30 years ago right but um yeah so i my experience is all bow, bow season and i think a lot of gun hunters um from the past not the recent when there was tons of population like you know the last few years everyone's shooting great bucks and seeing all this great deer no 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 i'm talking about the long average past uh generally speaking they don't see as many nice deer during the gun season as you do during bow season but of course archery is a little more difficult a little more involved for the hunt right so anyway i just want to get in first maybe into a little bit of the background of the axis there kind of how they live their daily life or you know you got to be a little bit of a biologist you got to know something about the animals to hunt them right so i would say that um of the vegetation that are out there axis deer they're primarily grazers so they'll graze grass off the ground um you can look them up in the google or whatever but uh, guinea grass is a pretty pretty popular feed for access there if you see a lot of guinea grass browsed off those are places to look um, the holly core trees it's a very long straight stalk tree with seeds and a very small leaf on it they like to eat the the, the seeds of that and then the leaves of that and then um keave beans keave being like the uh, english word being mesquite uh, those thorny very woody trees so those are um some of their food areas um, they generally the archery season you know if you took look at the latest video i went we, we were lucky because of the corona changes and all this stuff we got to hunt during the rut in the last most recent uh video that i have out but if you go a few seasons ahead of that uh back of that so to speak uh you know in time they're, you're gonna look at mostly velvet bucks and velvet and um, it was because the season was in February which is the upcoming season will be in February so you know it's not the rut it, they're, they're still in velvet and they do act differently <laughs> um, I've never I didn't hunt them in the rut a lot in fact that last video was maybe the second time I got to hunt deer in the rut I've hunted them on, on, the, on another area during the rut but when i really got to spend some time with a hunter in the rut and that was very different and maybe that contributed to you know me being uh, fortunate enough to shoot the 
get the buck that I did. But anyway, this season it's going to be doing mostly during velvet season. And in velvet season, in my opinion, the the deer generally, if, if people are hunting bucks or those, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, generally, they they're a little more predictable. You know, they they feed in the morning. Grant, if it's not a full moon or something like that, they feed in the morning till maybe I don't know anywhere between nine and, and and eleven. Then they'll bed down, bed most of the midday, and then feed in the afternoon. Now I do have to kind of. That's the general <laughs> way they live, but um, I'm going to spill some beans, spill some of my experience. I don't really have any secrets, and I think the more experienced guys know this if they watch them long enough. Mm, a lot of people, you know, they like, we like to hunt, they like to hunt the, the bigger bucks, the older bucks. And I'm just going to tell um, the viewers here that it's been my experience over the years watching them after they get past a certain age. They, maybe like any other deer anywhere else, they turn, they turn into a different animal. They act different. When they spook, they leave the herd, they run on their own, they don't run with the rest. Um, they do weird things. They, I've seen them bed from like 6 in the morning. I never see them get up till like it's dark till 6 at night. They just stay bedded all day. Now mind you, this, these are a different kind of deer very mature deer that has probably been hunted years and you know again like i said it's a public hunt high pressure all of that stuff so um but you can you know if you're just basically doing the general deal um the general hunt not you know just approaching this with a very open book whatever the general sense is yes feed in the morning bed in the midday find a shady spot to bed usually um, they're not like the mouflon out there. The mouflon out there may bed out in the open or bed in the rocks or something like that. Generally, the bucks will bed under a tree in the shade. Um, although I have seen a few bed out in the open in the hot sun. It's rare, in my opinion, but generally they do like to find a tree. Okay, knowing just a little bit about the deer, kind of just in general. And mind you, they, they go into some very thick stuff and you can find them out in the open too generally they like the vegetation they kind of like to to hide and and sneak around but um i think the next step would be kind of just talking general sense again is the terrain of the hunt there the lanai hunt there has a kind of wide range of terrains you know on one side of the hunting area it's a lot of gulches and a little rocky a lot of gulches but dirt up on the you know up on the higher slope areas and then if you go to the other side of the area, it's um, less of a steeper slope, like the island is more gradual to the ocean. But the terrain can be more rocky by the ocean and then kind of dirt up above. So you get a pretty good mix of terrain. And as far as um, physicality, I would say, you know, in preparation, of course, you always want to be in great shape, right? You, you want to be a healthy hunter. You don't want to be some fat slob out there, right? I mean, no offense to fat stuff, but hey. It is what it is, man. And I'm not here to BS you guys. So anyway, you do want to have some physicality, some health, right? If you want to hunt hard and those kinds of things. But it depends how you hunt too. Um, I prefer a spot and stalk method. You guys see the videos, you guys can see what I'm doing there. But uh, a lot of people are successful using ground blinds, you know, waiting on travel corridors, um, up in the higher elevation where there's more vegetation, the pine trees and stuff like that. They, they kind of sit and wait for them and stuff. And I've never done too much of that, if at all, really. I prefer spot and stalk, but um, I would have to say that, yeah, the spot and stalk game is probably a little more difficult to kill one, right? You got to have your stuff a little bit put together. Uh, maybe more learning curve, more experience than just kind of sitting there and, you know, waiting for one to go by. A little more about the physicality. So, you know, I'm gonna skew this, skew what I'm about to explain more toward my experience and how I like to hunt them again. So spot and stalk is a method that I like. Check my videos and if you guys look at my videos closely, I don't think it's any surprise or secret that a lot of the video I have of, you know, the mature bucks that a lot of people are after, um, they're bedded in my videos. Um, I see them walking around and stuff, but the majority of the real close, up close videos you see, are generally going to be on bedded deer. Um, now that that links into many things. <laughs> One to sneak up on a bedded deer and a bunch of them in a public hunt where there are a lot of hunters running around and stuff. 
sometimes you don't get those opportunities, right? There's a lot of people hiking around, things can go wrong, they're just not in one spot long enough for you to do this. So I do have to find these opportunities. And sometimes these opportunities requires me to, you know, be a bit more physical than the lazy guy. You gotta kind of put in the work in anything, right? So, um, but there's, there's like a balance in some of these things. So uh, what I was getting to is that, yeah, you can hike far and go deep and maybe find opportunities where there are less hunters to kind of foil your, your hunt or foil the animals that you find, you know, spook the animals that you find so you get more opportunities. There's some truth in that. But I would also say that I think a big mistake that a lot of access hunters make, and especially if you're a sheep hunter from the big island or um, maybe elk hunters from the from the west that I, that I see. I see some of those mainland guys out there walking around. I would think a big mistake that they make is I think sometimes if you don't know, I mean, how do I say it? Like I have this unfair advantage that I do know the areas very well, right? I've spent decades of my life in there. However, I watch a lot of people do a lot of hiking and not enough hunting and looking. And I mean, I've seen a lot of guys just walk through an area and probably spook a hundred deer in their walk. And maybe that's how they measure success, right? Maybe they go back to their buddies at camp and say, wow, I spooked a hundred deer. I, I saw a hundred deer today. Might've all been the ass end of the deer running away and never really got a shot or you have to fling long arrows or something like that. But maybe that's the way they measure success. Uh, for me and for what I'm trying to uh, impart to you guys here, uh, that kind of sucks just scaring deer all day, right? Hearing deer err, err, bark and everything and I don't know, it can probably get really frustrating and and out there in Lanai sometimes the density of animals can be quite high that you spook one, you spook the rest and you really kind of foil a lot of your hunt and you know I think a lot of people think that, um, that there's like these secret spots to find all these big bucks and all that stuff I really don't believe so. I've seen big deer pretty much down every road in that hunting area. What I would say for the people who are looking for these things is that you need to tailor the way you hunt for the area, you know, and that's paying attention to the wind pattern, paying attention where all the lazy hunters are gonna be. And, you know, find those zones that are quiet, find those zones that are, um, don't take shortcuts. Uh, I've seen deer, I've seen people just kind of walk lazy with the wind at their back and deer are running five, six hundred yards away. And it could even be further than that if you're spooking deer between here and there and those spook deer are taking the deer away. So I think a lot of bow hunters out there, um, and I've seen some guys in the afternoon, they just walk with their wind at their back the whole way. And because there's so much animals, they just think they'll just find the next opportunity, right? And fine and dandy if you like spooking a lot of animals and finding one that's a good opportunity, I guess. But I uh, I don't hunt that way. Um, but I do observe a lot of this. And how do I observe a lot of this? Is because I'm not walking around a lot. I'm watching, observing, seeing where they go, seeing what they do, and then adjusting the hunt along the way. Um, it's not uncommon in my strategy to, f to figure out where hunters approach from, where deer exit, and watching those uh, exit corridors those and those kinds of places so um, that's kind of very high level view of, of, of what I do out there and then I'll kind of I'll get into um, sneaking up to embedded okay so generally you guys watch the videos I like to sneak up to the big access box bedded generally um, if I think back in my time probably over 90% of the good access books that I have taken on this public state hunt has been from their bedded position. And in saying that, um, <laughs> I don't know that I could convince everyone listening here to, to, to try that because it is more difficult to get on them that way, but it is the way that I prefer to hunt a specific deer. If I was out there to just hunt any deer or any nice buck walking around or whatever that would come by um, you know maybe now I would because I, I kind of lazy and <laughs> I just uh, I don't need to spend that kind of frustration and time anymore but 
you know, back when I was, you know, pretty serious and, you know, younger and coming up and all this and wanting to go get those better ones, I prefer to stop embedded. And um, part of the reason is because um, it's a less dynamic situation. So um, when they're walking around and you get in front of them when they're feeding or stuff like that, a lot of things are moving. Sometimes there's a lot of eyes moving and things and the situation changes. Um, it's very difficult to set the trap that you want for the specific animal in the group. But if I was just hunting any deer in the group or something like that, or any nice one that I can get a first opportunity at, then I'll hunt them that way. It's definitely um, easier. It's less, less strain on the joints and stalking. But if I'm hunting a specific bug, I generally like to bet him. I generally like to figure out how he's living, how he moves, what he's doing, because it's not uncommon and I, my, my friends all know this and I'm almost afraid to share this, but it's not uncommon for me to sit on a deer, like literally stalk within bow range at 7, 6, 8, maybe 9, 11 in the morning and stay on them until almost dark when they stand up and I shoot them. And I have had quite a few of those where I've been there forever. And there's been quite a few times that I've sat there a long time and um, other hunters bebop along and spook them out. And that's just, that's just the way public hunting goes. And it can get pretty frustrating. So for a little bit of time, I, I used to hunt with the recurve, you know, the stick bow, you see those videos. And um, part of the reason why I don't use the stick bow too much anymore, one, because I don't practice enough with it. I don't want to be unethical wounding deer everywhere, but Two, it's it's hard it's hard to make the play like that when there's a lot of people walking around and the situation is going to change quick. Yeah, so um, sometimes with the with the compound, I can kind of push the issue. I can get in quicker or have more zone of fire um, to to get the shot off quicker. You know, if things go bad. So that's yeah, it's just me getting lazy, I guess. But uh, for what it's worth, I impart this experience here. Okay, so in stalking embedded, how do I do this? So my approach generally is this. This is, uh, I'm afraid to share this because now everybody's gonna do it, but um, there's not really any secrets, I think, because uh, it doesn't matter what I say out here, you're still gonna have to do the work, and the work sucks. It's not for everybody. Um, if you wanna have a, if you have a good time putting in the work, then this is for you. If you have a good time talking with your buddy, eating lunch in town or chilling and having a nap at night in town or something like that, then um, this is not the method for you. But hey, uh, I'm not saying one way is right or better. It's just say you do what you want to do out there and you have fun. You know, it's your vacation. It's your off time, man. Uh, do whatever you want. But uh, if you want my experience, uh, here's my experience for it. So sneaking up to them, uh, I generally will find them in the morning, something like that, moving around. And I'll find one that I want and I'll probably watch them until they bed. And many times, you know, with the other hunters out there, they, they end up vacating or going somewhere where I never get to watch them bed and I never get a stalk that day. Sucks, but that's, that's public bow hunting. And I think if you look at the last video, you'll see, um, I did not get to stalk that many bedded deer and I was waiting for an opportunity to stalk on that buck bedded and it never came for days. And when it finally came, um, that's when I got the arrow in them. But it did not, definitely did not go the way I thought it would. But anyway, getting back to it. So he beds, and let me play out a scenario here. Um, they bed under a tree in a shady spot. Hopefully you have wind. Um, generally speaking, if you don't have any wind, like it's just doldrums out there, you're baking in the hot sun, you know, it's very unlikely unless you have like a clear path or some great path to them. It's very unlikely to sneak up to them with no wind. And I'm talking like even a hundred yards is sometimes difficult. Depending on the deer that you're hunting, you know, dolls or whatever, average deer or whatever, maybe you can, you can get away with it. But older, older deer, they just don't tolerate that kind of stuff. And there's a part in my last video where I, 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 I kind of narrated where um, it would be like just dead wind. The bucks are about 180 yards away. And I would literally just touch the grass with my hand like a ch -ch -ch, just like that. And they pick up their ears and start looking up the hill and all kinds of stuff. 
and that was like 150 yards away. That's far. You would never think they could hear something that far, but um, they're on edge, you know. It's a public hunt, it's crowded. They're skittish, they're jumpy, which is gonna get into later on about the shooting part and them dodging arrows that everyone likes to talk about. Um, but anyway, um, back to the stalking, yeah. So you're gonna want some wind at least. I mean, there's many times where like, if there's no wind and there's really not any deer I'm really after out there or something like that, I might just pack it up, go and go have lunch and chill with the guys or something because maybe we'll get some wind in the afternoon. Because it's kind of, it can be pretty frustrating just sitting around out there with no wind. And when there's no wind, even, I've had instances where they get close enough for me to draw and shoot and just the sound of my clothes moving, just, I mean, you can't hear it, but just that, I, they jerk their heads up and walk away really fast. Like they may not even bark or bolt, but they just know something's not right and they'll just leave. So it can be super frustrating with no wind. And that's something to take into account. I was talking about their hearing being super good. And uh, yeah, it's no secret. I think a lot of other local hunters do this, but I carry a pair of what we call Tobbies. They're felt bottom, uh, felt bottom shoes for the, for the mainland guys that might not understand this concept. But anyway, it's like, this is like footwear we make in Hawaii for people that, um, to walk on the slippery algae covered reefs. You know, if you're fishing or stuff like that. But um, they're pretty quiet for sneaking around. And so, you know, like you see maybe on the mainland guys that take off their boots and they stalk up to the mule deer or something like that in their socks. Well, uh, uh, Lanai has big keiave trees with, with huge thorns. And um, if you want to stalk up to them in your socks, Hey, have fun with that, but uh, if you step on one of those thorns, you're going to be barking uh, louder than the deer out there. So, uh, I carry a pair of toppies like this. They're pretty thick. These are the, I don't know, Deep Sea or Pihi Ergos. You can buy this at Walmart or something. But anyway, they, they got a little bit of thicker bottom here so that it's a little longer than the thorns. So hopefully the thorns don't go through them. If you're on Molokai where the thorns are even bigger, uh, yes, the thorns do go through them and that sucks. But uh, for Lanai, the Kiavi and Lanai are a little bit smaller thorned in my opinion. And um, you know, you can get by these and they're pretty quiet. And that's how I sneak up to them on general rule. Like if you can hear yourself, uh, that's probably too loud. So um, I like to put those on for the final approach. I might um, take my pack and stuff, put it in a place I can find it, of course. Don't lose your shit out there. But uh, you know, within reason, 100, 200 yards, whatever, depending on the situation, uh, put on my tobbies and kind of go stealth mode. Sometimes, um, you know, your pants brushing against the brush can make enough noise that they can hear, so I'll roll up the pants and then kind of just have bare legs uh, walking in. Yeah, you scratch up your legs and stuff, but hey, you got to do what you got to do, right? Um, and I think that's something that if you're coming from big, a lot of big island guys, we like to hunt over there, right? I'm one and myself you guys hunt a lot of sheep and goats and stuff my biggest word of advice or suggestion would be do not hunt deer like you hunt sheep and goats sheep and goats they generally don't use their ears like that no super old rams on Mauna Kea or something like that that I bow hunting yes they use their ears and they freak out but for the most part they don't use their ears like deer do so deer may not have the eyesight power of like the mouflon or the sheep out there but their ears are far more superb. They trust their ears and when they hear stuff, they, they turn them around like little radar dishes and um, they'll just leave quietly. And then you'll just be sneaking up to a tree with nothing under it. And when you get there, they're gone. And I think a lot of, I think some of you guys listening out there be like, what? That's probably exactly what happened. They, you know, you never saw them leave. You think you didn't bust them or anything. Yet when you get there, they're gone. Chances are they probably heard you coming if nothing else. So um, that's something to really take into consideration. Your, your sound, how you're going to make a silent approach, wind, all that kind of stuff. And then the other thing just comes with experience, right? When you're stalking up to embedded, it's not uncommon for me to have to crawl 100 yards. And this is inch by inch, foot by foot, you know, minute by minute into hours. And you got to do what it takes. Um, don't cut corners because it's not going to work on the old ones like that. So. Um, like I said, it's it's not really a secret because you're still going to have to do the work and 90% of people out there probably, you don't want to put in that kind of work to get close like that. It, it sucks. And um, 
But anyway, yeah, maybe I'll cut in some clips in here of some of my more iconic clips of getting getting pretty close to on this hunt. But um, it's tough, and uh, I, I've. I don't have too much experience hunting access deer on like private, more exclusive, maybe less pressured ranches and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, this hunt, um, as the season goes on generally, maybe like the first few days of the archery season, they're more tolerant of people. Um, they didn't get the memo yet. But after the first day or two, then they're, they're pretty skittish like anywhere else. They start freaking out at everything. So. And then uh, another thing to take into consideration when you're doing this stock is that sometimes there's a lot of animals everywhere, including mouflon sheep, and mouflon sheep have amazing eyesight. So you're almost gonna have to stalk around the mouflon because if the mouflon start blowing and start getting crazy, sometimes their alert nature can kind of make the deer leave and that can kind of screw up your hunt too. Um, it's been my experience, strangely, I don't know why this is, uh, the does are usually a little more skittish bedded than the bucks, um, depending what bucks I'm talking about. Um, you know, maybe bucks in that mid mid area, like, you know, people might consider them big, but like that, that 28 to like 32 inch range kind of buck, that kind of stuff. I'm not a guy for measuring, but I'm just trying to give you a frame of reference here. They're a little less cautious, I think, bedded than the does. The does are more skittish. But after they get to a certain point bigger than that, uh, you know, these 35 inch bucks and stuff like that. Those guys turn into different animals. But uh, for the most part, I've seen bachelor herds of bucks around that, you know, that, that mid range size, um, all grouped together and mouflon rams be blowing at me and all kinds of stuff. And these bucks, they just don't care. I've seen sheep run right past them sometimes, you know, from me spooking them or somebody else spooking them and these bucks don't care. But if those are those there, psh, they'd be gone. Or if there was, uh, you know, the older, the bigger bucks, uh, they'd have been gone long before the sheep got there. They'd have heard them blow up the hill and they would have left quietly. So, you know, there can be, um, there can be some, some differences there. All right, let me expand a little bit about the, um, the hiking too much part. Uh, again, I see a lot of guys, they want to cover a lot of ground, right? Like these, these back country or these hardcore elk hunters or the guys from Big Island, right? Dark to dark, walking hard. Hey. I sympathize with you, I know that game. But the hunting area is not big in Lanai. You're gonna walk road to road pretty quick like that, spook everything out of the area, and then what you're gonna do. If that's what you wanna do and go home for go home for lunch at lunchtime or something like that, then cool. By all means, have fun. I'll sit there, watch them run, bed, and then I'll go get them later. But, uh, you know, I see a lot of that. Like, a lot of hiking, a lot of moving around, and um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's just not as, in my opinion, it's not as conducive uh, to success on them if you're going to be the spot and stock hunter, you know. Um, I think there's a lot of locals out there uh, that hunted a long time. They got their places that they like to hunt and they know where the deer travel and things like that. So they just kind of hang out in those areas. And they're just hanging out in the kitchen or the bedroom here and there and they're getting opportunities that way too. Not really putting in tons of miles or anything like that. They kind of just learn the zone, observe, and then um, play it that way. So, mind you, like, you know, if you're new to the area or something like that and you gotta cover ground to figure out what you're gonna do uh, later in the week or in the day, fine, by all means, hey, cover ground, hike it, uh, survey and prospect all you want. But I do see some pretty experienced guys make that mistake. I think they, they hike a lot. They think that just covering ground is their mode to success. And maybe it is, if it is, by all means, have fun. But I just, I see them spook a lot of deer. And I see them spook a lot of big deer that maybe they never get the opportunity to see because of their high impact in the area. If they were to find a way to enter more stealthily, more sneaky, maybe they would see the deer that don't vacate before they even get to lay eyes on them. Okay, now let's touch a little bit about the equipment. Uh, for the spot and stalk hunter, obviously you need to spot them before you can stalk them. So a good pair of binoculars, uh, I use a pair of 10 by 42s no, no, you're not gonna typically look super far, so maybe you can get away with an eight power set. Um, but like anything that spawn is thought, you know, I think buy the best glass that you can afford. Um, maybe even put more money into the glass than even your bow, uh, if you can. Um, I use a pair of Swarovski, Swarovski's 10 by 42s. I think a lot of other hunters do. They, they opt for those European Leica Zeiss 
and those um, you know you got to see them before you can hunt them and I think a lot of I think a lot of hunters out there maybe the diehard guys who spend a lot of time they can get they can get away with more experience and have lesser glass because they know what they're looking for but if you if you don't have a lot of experience with them and you're looking for them for the first time I think you, you need to have some pretty good glass you'd be surprised how a spotted pretty deer like that can kind of mix up in the in the grass or uh, in the brush over there so they're not that easy to find usually the bucks are easy to find with the white ears and the the white tips on the antlers or the long velvet antlers but yeah they're a little bit of learning curve over there spotting them so definitely get some get some pretty good glass now it's hot you're hunting in hawaii you know sunshine and ocean and all that so you're gonna want to have a bunch of water if you're not used to hot climates you know hunting in 80 degree weather and doing some hiking in that with the beating sun um, definitely that's something to consider you know don't want people dying a heat stroke or suffering out there and then also sun protection um, some people make fun of like the boonie hat style the full brim boonie hats and stuff like that and they see us locals wearing them at uh, yeah, when the mainland guys come over with their ball caps and their ears are hanging out, you know, by the ocean and then they get the sunburn right on top of the ears and that hurts like hell. Yeah, maybe there's some wisdom into having like a full brim. Um, you don't need it, you know, you wear sunscreen or whatever like that, that's cool. But just know that um, sunny weather in Hawaii, in my opinion, is a lot more UV rays than sunny weather, you know, up in the mainland or something like that. You know, I can sit, I can go in the sun at you know shooting at the reading shoot or something like that it's hot it could be 90 degrees in the sun out there but i don't get the kind of sunburn that i get when i'm hunting in the nye so just understand that the sun in the nye it might look the same but the uv rays are maybe higher than where you live at so you know invest in sunscreen um, cover shade that kind of thing okay let's get into some of the bow hunting stuff now bow hunting equipment probably um what a lot of techie people are all into and stuff but i'm going to try to keep it as simple as i can giving you my experience with it and maybe you can take that into consideration when picking your bow hunting gear specifically for access um let's just go over my bow real quick so current current hunting bow i'm shooting right now this is the uh um, what is this this is the hoyt uh, ventum pro yeah hoyt ventum pro this is a 30 inch axle to axle model I have not killed a deer with this bow yet. My old bow was a uh, Pro Defiant Hoyt. Um, this bow has only gone a couple of times around Big Island and um, this just recently went on the uh, New Mexico Ibex hunt with me in January. Love the bow, great bow. Um, little shorter, that 30 inch. I don't have a very long draw. I'm a 26 and maybe a three quarter inch draw. But uh, some of the things to consider, of course, get a bow that you can shoot straight, right? Um, really spend some time shooting getting your shooting down and all of that and um i think a lot of people they spend too much time on their equipment and not enough time on their skill and ability uh you know if you can find somebody um, that's a better shooter than you to make you a, a better bow shot definitely do that and um you know if you can get your proficiency up there it's just it's just been my opinion the way I like to hunt. Um, I compete, you know, competitive archery and all of that. The archery part, the shooting part, is not a very big part of my bow hunting game anymore. Um, shooting at deer and stuff is a big target relative to competition. So, um, but it just depends what you want to do in your life, right? I've seen a lot of people preparing for a hunt. They start shooting their bow a lot, and if they have, you know, habits of anticipation or the dreaded target panic the more you shoot with that kind of the more you ingrain the bad habit and then you go in the hunt kind of feeling with less confidence sometimes if they shoot too much so something to consider there if you're looking at improving your shooting you know maybe look at competitive archery that kind of stuff but uh, i'm digressing a little bit but anyway special on this boat um i think for most people you know everyone wants to get into the long range archery game like shooting far and yes, I do on this site, it is a sliding five pin and I do have a tape, you know, out to the triple digits deal. But it, I'm gonna tell you, it is super, super, super highly unlikely that I will be dialing this site to shoot at any access there.
because they like to dodge a lot of arrows coming. And I'll get into that in more detail later. I do have the option if I need it, but that is a very, very situational specific option. I don't just wing arrows all over the place. I see some brothers out there, you know, they, they judge their success by whether they come back with an empty quiver. Um, arrows aren't cheap, man. It's a pretty expensive way of hunting. So um, unless that's what you like doing, then they have fun. But um, I'd like to suggest a, a little more uh, accurate way of, of going about that and might save you some money too. Um, but anyway, some things that I do a little bit different than others. I actually have two uh, limb dampeners inside of here. It usually comes with one, but I have two in here. And it does quiet the bow a little bit more. I don't know if it has affected accuracy in any way. Um, I can't tell. Anyway, it's good enough. Minute of kill zone. So I'm not trying to compete with this bow or anything. And then, of course, something that's fairly quiet. You want a bow that's fairly quiet. It's just been my opinion that now a loud bow is not bad. Um, it's just that on the close shots, anywhere like 35 yards and in, perhaps I think the sound of the bow really, really trigger the deer into ducking or, or turning to the side and I can get way into more experience with that. But anyway, um, yeah, little dampeners have more, um, quite more bow noise. And um, yeah, like you, uh, I don't have a quiver on this bow right now, but it's a detachable quiver. I always opt for a detachable quiver because in a lot of places, um, it can be pretty windy. Lanai can be pretty windy, but I was hunting the Florida mountains for um, Ibex in New Mexico. That place is super windy and you have to make long shots. So um, sometimes that arrow quiver can act like a sail in the wind and it's hard to hold the bow steady. And um, yeah, if I can take it off and make a shot, I can make a more precise, better balanced bow shot. But beyond that, a lot of times a quiver makes a lot of noise when people shoot that hollow sound up in the quiver. Maybe you can fill it up with foam or whatever, but it's just been my experience. The bow is also quieter if you can take that quiver off. So a lot of the deer I shoot at, I do not have the quiver on the bow, uh, especially if it's gonna be a little further shot or something like that. I take the quiver off, I take the time and try to make a good shot. Um, that may not be easy to do with the deer having good hearing, but you know, this is just a little fine details that um, that I put into my access stock. So, all right, so bow explained. Now let's uh, get into the get into the arrows, get into the the axes bullets that I use. Um, this has been a whole bow hunting career of mine to get the experience that I have now. And mind you, for different bow hunters, different draw lens, different styles of hunting, whatever, you can have different results. But I'm just going to share my experience with it. I think you're going to hear a lot on the internet and everywhere else that Axis deer are among the quickest deer out there. That they dodge arrows like almost no other animal can. And in my experience, yes, this is, this is very true. I would say that I have probably had more deer dodge my arrows than I have hit deer very very discouraging especially when you get on some pretty big ones and they somehow um dodge your arrows that's heartbreaking but i've learned a few things in in, in over the years in how to maybe get a get away and, and make the shots and have them not move so much and one of those things that i think contributes to it is the sound of the arrow um, the sound of the arrow flying to the air at the animal now I mentioned that maybe 35 yards and in, the sound of the bow may kind of startle them or something. I also feel that if you're shooting maybe further than 45, 50, 60, 70 yards kind of stuff and beyond, the sound of the arrow flying maybe has more impact. And how do I, how have I quantified this? I've quantified this or I have correlated this, this theory by a lot of deer that I've shot at. So generally speaking, when I shot at deer close, 35 yards and in, their general mode of dodging me is ducking, is loading up that front legs and ducking. I hit them through the back shaft so I shoot clear over them. You may want to aim low for these kinds of things. I haven't because I have aimed low before and missed them low. They don't move. So I just aim where I want to hit them and pray for the best but i have changed my projectile to get better uh to get better success on this and i'll get into that but anyway that was one reason why i think the bow that startling noise was making them duck now further away 40 50 60 70 80 yards that kind of stuff 
my general experience has been less ducking and more turning away from the arrow. And I even have one instance where, okay, I just, for sake of this video, I guess I gotta share it because that's my data. Uh, I did shoot at one buck, uh, guys in Lanai, they hunt Manele and stuff, they know this. Um, they know that area. It's pretty tough to get close to them, they're pretty smart, but um, I got on a buck, I got pretty close, bedded, never got a shot. But he had walked and fed out. Somehow I never got a shot the whole time, but somehow he fed out to 90. Pretty far shot, right? I mean, I don't suggest this on anyone. But I know I make that shot all the time. I was very rested. Um, there was a slight breeze, but not bad. And they were so calm that, you know, I wanted to bring home meat. And uh, dialed my sight, took the shot. And when I took the shot, it was really interesting because as I was paying attention to the arrow fly in the air, the buck was feeding, and before the arrow hit him, he looked straight up in the air at the arrow before it came down on him. He didn't look at me, didn't look where the sound came from. He snapped his head up and looked straight up and then turned away. And as he turned away, the arrow hit him kind of quartering away and he didn't even go 12 yards. Like, he went down so fast that arrow got there and it's far away enough that I can't really hear the impact, but I slammed up my binos, watched all the other deer run away real fast and never saw him. I was like, holy cow, what happened? Did he just exit out the bottom some back door or something? Truth is he bellied up in 12 yards. That's why I didn't see him. He was already on the ground so fast. So, um, but yeah, he didn't look at the sound. He looked at, or at the sound of the bow. He looked at the arrow coming in from the sky. So that was one. And then just the way they act, the turning away versus the startled uh, ducking mode like something's coming at me i'm turning away versus um just hearing a loud noise and, and loading up the legs um the other thing that i've experienced with ducking and something that maybe you might want to take into consideration is i've had more access deer and i said it in my last hunting video access if you guys check that the 2022 lanai season or whatever um i've had more access deer duck me from a feeding position than I have with their heads up, you know, kind of alert. I know that might sound crazy, but I don't know. Like I feel I get more, <laughs> I get more anxiety shooting at axis deer with their heads down feeding than I do shooting at them with their heads up. And I think some of that has to do with their heads down and they're in the grass and stuff. I think sounds and things like that startle them more like because they, they just can't see they don't know what's going on so they are more inclined and they usually not as much duck but they turn away really quick when they hear sounds when they're feeding like a lot of spinning action um just my experience you might experience otherwise but i have shot a lot of deer with their heads up maybe not necessarily fully startled but with just their heads up you know send the arrow they do jerk but I don't think they have the ability to jerk as far with their heads up than as if when their heads are down. So yes, sometimes I do hit them higher. I do kind of aim on the lower third or something like that on those and I, and I hit them perfect. But hey, for what it's worth, that's just my experience with it. Um, take it for what it is. So some people might, you know, you might think, oh, it's this perfect opportunity. Their heads are down, they're feeding. They don't even know I'm here and you shoot and whoosh, they, 180 90 degree spin on you your arrow goes right past where they were and you're just left there like what the heck you know or um the local guys out there i actually shot a doe one time with with my buddy and uh this doe was broadside at uh, at 35 yards broadside took the shot everything spun and moved so fast i didn't even know what happened like all i know was shot there was no deer there suddenly right and i'm like i don't know what happened but anyway i went and walked over there blood trailed the deer and I literally I mean it's embarrassing to say this but it is what happened I literally found the deer with the with the arrow um, pretty much under her butthole going through her lengthwise so you know like the guys diving those quick mimpachis in the in the cave where you, you shoot them facing you and then somehow you pull one out from the tail end like the thing spun around so fast before the arrow got there generally I think that's what happened she was broadside and somehow I got them like this so um Whatever the case is there, but uh, just thought I'd share some of that experience with you on the ducking and the dodging, and maybe you can incorporate some of that knowledge maybe into into your hunt for a little bit more success. All right, I said I was going to talk about the bullets, never even got to it, right? I kind of gave you all the access um, 
experience that I had shooting at them. So now into the bullets. Um, basically you want as quiet of an arrow that you can get to shoot out there. And there are differences between what you pick on the front for your broadheads and what you pick on the back for your veins that can kind of determine whether your arrow is louder or quieter. Um, there's some, I know some folks out there that they like to shoot super light arrows, shoot 300 feet a second, and they feel like the speed is going to make up for the ducking or the dodging. And that may be true, uh, but I'm a short draw guy, I'm <laughs> under 26 inch kind of draw, so speed is not really something that, um, that, that I can take into consideration unless I want to shoot like a 300 grain arrow or something like that, and I'm not going to do that. Um, so speed is not something I can take into um, into my calculations for building an arrow, but generally what I'm holding here is just a basic uh, Actually, let me just start with what I what I currently shoot with right now. So what I currently shoot is a This is an axis 5 millimeter uh, Eastern axis 3 345 millimeter arrow uh, No plug at Eastern doesn't sponsor me or anything right now at the time of this video, but I, I, I really feel I've shot a lot of arrows I really feel like Easton makes some of the most consistent uh, build arrows and the Axis series, the 5mm, 6mm, and even maybe even the 4mm. However they construct the carbon, I feel, has the most consistent groups down range. It doesn't have maybe a seam in it or whatever, um, but it's just my experience. I don't know. I've never been to the factory. I don't know for sure, but it's just been my experience and something you might want to consider. But anyway, what it is, yep. Axis 5mm, I have a 50 grain brass insert inside of here, broadhead collar, and then if you can't look, this is the old sever, sever mechanical broadhead, so yeah, the, you know, the blades come out and deploy there. Um, short draw guy, and you're probably wondering, maybe I shouldn't shoot a mechanical, I'll get into a reason why. Um, but anyway, the back of the arrow, these are um, 275 tack veins. I haven't shot any deer with the tack vein yet. My old arrow that I used to use a lot, and I shot a lot of deer with actually, is this 5mm axis, same shaft, everything. Um, 50 grain brass in the front, but these are uh, 360 flex fletch veins in the back. The reason I pick these veins is because they're very quiet compared to some of the alternatives out there. Um, alternatives being, everyone knows the Blazer. So the Blazer is a um, very popular vein. It's pretty noisy compared to these two. And then some people like to four fletch arrows. Um, generally, it's been my experience that four fletch arrows are a little bit more noisy than three fletch. So something to consider there. So I kind of always opt for a three, fet, three fletch version arrow if I if I can. But whatever shoots accurate for you, hey, you do you, right? Um, but anyway, yeah, these are the ones I shoot. Oh, general convention too on, on noise. I think these are like. 0.45 or something tall, inch tall, 0.46 tall or something like that. Whereas the blazer is over a half inch tall. Um, general conventions with with fletching noises, the taller the vein, the noisier the vein is going down range. So if you can get away with a shorter vein, uh, not as tall, I'm not talking about length, I'm talking about height off the shaft, it can be a little quieter. However, you also need to balance, you know, what kind of broadhead you're trying to steer on the front of your arrow and match that with the vein. And I think a lot of people use too small a vein sometimes that it doesn't make up for their inconsistencies in the way they shoot. But anyway, um, that's for a whole nother video. But uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I said I'd get into why. So yeah, mechanical broadhead for axis steer. Generally, I carry both mechanical and fix and fix fixed blade arrow uh, broadheads inside of my quiver. And the reason for that is, uh, I'll generally, if I'm stalking on the move, you know, I'm not stalking a bedded deer or something, I'm stalking on the move, I'll generally have a fixed blade on my arrow because if the situation is gonna be a closer shot and there may be brush in the way or something like that, I like to shoot the fixed blade. And what I shoot for a fixed blade is like a 100 grain standard slick trick, a uh, four blade. Um, some other ones I liked were the, uh, were like the Wacoms. Uh, I got a friend who uses the QED Exodus, as I think it's called. Anyway, they're all pretty, pretty good fixed blades, but fixed blades are generally going to have more sound flying through the air. There's blades, you know, explode, exposed blade surface flying through the air and all that. And it's going to make more noise. And 
you know, if you're going to make longer range shots with those fixed blades, you're going to need bigger veins in the back to guide them for the mistakes that you make when you shoot, the inconsistencies in your shooting. Otherwise, you're just not going to get good grouping. So, um, all in all, shooting the fixed blades will probably force you to have a arrow that's more noisy in flight. If it works for you, it works for you. But I like to um, put as many things in my favor as I can. So, you know, if the situation is dynamic, close, I got to shoot, shoot through brush, yes, I will use the fixed blade. And I can shoot the, um, I can shoot the slick trick with a three fletch of this 275. It's not as consistent as maybe this 360 flex fletch with the fixed blade, but it'll get me by up to 40, 50 yards if I really, really need it. Um, but if I can, I prefer to shoot the mechanical at the axis there. So say it's going to be broadside shot, I sneak up uh, to a bedded one, I can plan the situation, I've got a lot of time, or it's going to be a longer shot in the wind, or something like that, but it's going to be a clear target, I'm going to want to go with the, with the mechanical. The mechanical just doesn't have the exposed blade surface, it's going to be quieter in flight, it's going to be, uh, or rather more quiet in flight. Uh, the veins on the back, the smaller veins like these 275s can steer it better. You're going to just get better, uh, better accuracy and consistency. And then when they deploy, um, you know, as long as you're not hitting them in the shoulder or something like that, you're doing your job, being a good archer, making a good shot. It's more likely you're going to hit them back in the guts than in the front. Now, I say that after if you guys look at my Ibrix video, I hit a Ibrix of a lifetime probably in the front. Oh well, shit happens. But uh, most times you hit things in the back. My last access buck I hit back, he lunged as I took a shot. All of those things, and if you got a bigger, um, generally the mechanicals will have a bigger cutting, cutting diameter or cutting uh, length. Um, it's gonna do more damage on a shot like that, and I would suggest more likelihood of recovering the deer that, that, that you didn't hit perfectly. So, um, Anyway, that, 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 that has something to play with it. I used to shoot, a uh, popular one is, are the Rages. But it's been my experience that the Rages, like the, 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 there's a lot of, there's actually quite a bit of exposed blade on the Rages. And it is, those Rage mechanicals are, they're quite noisy in flight. There's a lot of holes in the ferrule and whatever. So as it's flying, it's actually pretty noisy. So, um, I love these severs. They're really simple. Um, there's like a silicone band that goes on on here and they're rear deploying but with the band that holds it if you pull it backwards in the brush and stuff like that it won't deploy the blades it's just much simpler to use and less exposed blade surface i get better accuracy downrange so i highly recommend them this is, this is the old version the 175 i actually shoot the one and a half um the uh the smaller cut diameter for my short draw so I can get a little more penetration but I've shot these 175s too and they work just fine and what about the traditional guys right so I have at least one video on there when I was hunting on my traditional gear right my recurve and this, this is my recurve arrow um, just a standard gold tip traditional and I've got a four inch true flight feathers back here uh, now this is a real strange experience Obviously the recurve throws the arrow a whole lot slower and these feathers back here and having to shoot I shoot a two blade magnus in the front of this sometimes can make this arrow pretty loud flying down range Yet strangely, I don't know why I've had Out of a lot of axis deer I've shot at I've probably I can only think of one or two deer that actually moved before my recurve uh, arrow got there I actually to kind of almost have one on film that um, I intentionally aimed low because I thought he would duck me at a little over 30 yard shot. I thought he would duck me because there was no wind and I actually shot right where I was aiming and the arrow actually went in the dirt and probably slapped his belly with the, with the back end of the arrow and uh, sent that nice buck on its way. But uh, anyway, yeah, he didn't move. Um, don't know why that is, maybe just the way it sounds, it's less intimidating, maybe it sounds like a bird flying, I don't know. But uh, I haven't experienced as much deer jumping my string with the, with the recurve. Um, my buddy Riley, who almost hunts exclusively with the stick bow, he's had a lot of them duck his long bow or his, his, his recurve. So 
I don't know, my experience varies with the traditional stuff and you know, <laughs> hunting any axis out there, especially lanai with traditional, if you can pull that off, uh, that's really something. I mean, you, you put yourself at a massive disadvantage anyway. So um, kudos to you and man, good luck out there if, if you're gonna do that. And I, I do have friends that, um, that hunt, with, hunt with the stick bow pretty exclusively. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, they're not, I mean, they want to fill their tags and eat deer, but uh, the reality is it's it's pretty tough with the stick bow. Anyway, um, yeah, that's a little bit about the, the recurve arrow. I don't know, I don't have too much ducking experience and other people do, so hard to say there. All right, so I think that was a pretty long video about hunting the axis and just my experience with it and the way I do it, some of the equipment I use, some of the strategies, some of the things you can think about. Of course, there are tons of experience that I could talk about there. I mean, I gotta make other videos for that. But if you want, if you guys want to want me to elaborate on anything that was presented here, um, certainly just put in the comments, the folks that know the social media or whatever, just let me know there and hopefully maybe I can add some more value or shorten your learning curve or I don't know. I just wanna, I just wanna provide you guys a quality experience out there so you enjoy the hunt. And um, I feel like with this hunting thing, you know, just in my life that the more proficient I've become or the less things I have to worry about when going on the hunt, the more I can enjoy the whole hunt itself. I don't know if that makes sense, you know? Like, if you're not worried about whether I can make the shot or worried about whether I can stalk and all these things, I know I can do all those things. I really get to enjoy the fresh air, the sunsets, my friends, the time, the conversations, the people. All those other things about the hunt that's kind of cool. So I kind of, I don't know. I really feel like if I can shorten your learning curve and make that part something you think about less, that maybe you we could put more value and really take in more of the other parts of the hunt that uh, we otherwise would not be focusing on if we were so focused on just trying to kill a deer because <laughs> that's hard enough in itself. So anyway, I hope this video has added some value for you. Um, Hopefully, maybe on this axis hunt, some of you guys get your first axis out there or maybe get the one that you want, whatever it is. Um, anyway, again, I enjoy making the video. I like talking about this stuff. We can geek out all night, all day, all week, all year on this kind of thing. Anyway, I only have so much time here with you guys. So if you want to see more, put it in the comments, let me know. Again, catch you guys in the next video and good luck with the axis hunt. Aloha, guys. Bye-bye.